Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHope2018.com. We've been going through the Epistle to the Ephesians verse by verse, and in my last video, we were at verse 16 of chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verse 16. What a marvelous revelation of grace that through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have put off the old man, that God is renewing us in the spirit of our minds, and that we have put on the new man. In the uh, light of that revelation, we're looking now at our practical walk in Christ. When Daniel had a vision from the Lord, he was sick for 40 days. When Paul received a vision from the Lord, he received knowledge of things which was not lawful for him to utter and a thorn in the flesh as well. You and I are told in the Word of God that we stand in God's presence where others fell because we are clothed with the infinite righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. And until we fully comprehend what all that means, then our earthly walk becomes one of disappointment and disillusionment. One where we, we're just constantly beating the flesh and trying to make it acceptable to God and getting it to present sacrifices which are acceptable and meaningful to God and none of that works. We can't beat the flesh into submission. We have this treasure in earthen vessels in order that the excellency of the power might be of Christ and not of us. And until one fully realizes that the total depravity of man in his carnal state destroyed the will and the mind as far as God is concerned, we cannot comprehend the exhortation that we're looking at here as it concerns our Christian walk. If we make these exhortations only exhortations to the old man, we're doomed to defeat. Many a Christian has told me that I have tried repeatedly to reckon myself dead indeed unto sin, but it doesn't work. As though reckoning one dead indeed unto sin is some kind, some kind of an operation accomplished in such a way that the old nature no longer commits acts of sin. In other words, the person believes that reckoning is supposed to prevent one from sinning. Whereas the Holy Spirit's exhortation is simply that we accept what is true, that even though that old man never does anything but sin, we are dead to sin and alive unto God, Romans 6.11. And when you don't comprehend that as truth, you're not in true fellowship and communion with your loving Heavenly Father. Now we got down to verse 16, buying up the time, the word for time, there is kairos, not chronos. As you might remember from the previous video, I would translate that taking every opportunity. The word is ex agarazzo, and I pointed out that it's the term used to buy for possession, not to buy for resale that we should be eager in our buying up the opportunities because the days are evil. We read those uh, things um, lightly. You know, we tend to read them lightly. And I sometimes wonder, and I'm talking about myself as well as you, whether we really comprehend what the Holy Spirit is saying. I think... We're all willing to agree that some of the days are evil, or at least some part of the days are evil. There aren't many of us who are fully persuaded that the entertainment industry, the literature medium, 
the educational institutions, government institutions are all evil when it comes to spiritual truth. There's a movement today that suggests that only in our uh, becoming one happy global family can we ever solve all of our problems, the world's problems. Racism, economic difficulties, wars, and so on. Corporate America promotes this idea even through television commercials. I noticed that during the Super Bowl. And that will not work. That theology is evil theology. It's the devil's theology, not God's. The days in which we live are evil. Man's uh, great attempts to do without God, to make the world a better place to live in without Christ. I believe that we're going to increasingly hear the cry for peace when there is no peace. The Bible declares there is no peace for the wicked. The only peace this world and these nations and you will ever know is in Christ Jesus. And separate from that, there is a concerted effort put forth by Satan and his hosts to convince us that there are other roads to peace there are not. Therefore, Christians are hesitant to give much thought that God has made us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Ask yourself, when was the last time that you heard a brother or a sister in the Lord tell you, remind you, that we stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. Yet it is true, and the old man is surely carnal and filthy and dirty and unacceptable to God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And as I pointed out, those are not terms of heaven and hell, but are terms of fellowship and communion with God. More and more, my heart aches that I see multiplied thousands of Christians who are not at peace with God. When God is at peace with them. A hundred thousand times, it seems to me, I've contemplated the scene of the Lord Jesus Christ suddenly appearing in the midst of the disciples in the upper room and saying, Peace I leave with you. Those are surely not the words I would have used. Like, you dumb idiots, don't you remember what I told you? But he didn't do that. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. And he gave it. And yet I find by the thousands that those who profess to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ are not living in the sphere of that peace. The days are evil. We should buy up the opportunities. So what are those opportunities? I'd be more than thrilled to buy them up if I knew what they were, and it seems as though there is some kind of charge one could level against God's people that there seems to be a confusion on the opportunities. I'm not w unwilling to buy them up if I knew what they were. I'm, I'm not certain that I can answer that question for you, but I believe that the answer should be obvious to each one of us who's walking under the control of the Holy Spirit. And that's where the text is going. I believe that the Holy Spirit anticipated our question. What are these opportunities that I should redeem? If I could fully comprehend the evilness of the days, we walk in intense evil with carnal minds that are totally depraved. They don't have any spark of goodness in them. When I was a child in the 60s, of course, 
you know, one looks up to his father. I, I had a fantastic young childhood. I sit back many times and think of the family in which the Lord placed me. There were times as a child, I didn't think my dad was uh, fantastic. I, I found that out after he died. But he was a tremendous father. He liked cars, and all I heard from the time I started to uh, lust after a, a pickup, I don't know, four or five years old, I guess, uh, whenever that is, up until I could finally drive myself, all I heard from my father was that pickup trucks were unstable. They didn't hold the road very well. They cost too much money. They didn't last as, as, as long. They had lots of maintenance trouble. Now, I'm persuaded at this point in my life that my father was wrong. But he didn't think that he was wrong. I now had a uh, mindset from a child who thought his father was super, uh, except when he made me work, that pickups were no good. And had you offered me free as a gift uh, one of those big fat round Chevys or, or those Chryslers or Buicks or whatever or, or an Imperial or New Yorker or a pickup truck I'd have probably taken the fat round Chevy my dad had in the terms of my illustration a depraved mindset there wasn't any reasoning to it his, his mind had been already set in that frame and that's where our carnal mind is. It has a mindset which is totally anti-God and, and in my dad's case anti-pickup truck and now the Holy Spirit comes along and says that you have put off that old mind, that old man, that you're being renewed in the spirit of your mind, not in the flesh of your mind, not the carnal mind, but the spiritual mind and that you, you have put on the new man. Now, buy up the opportunities because the days in which we live are evil. But I'm not sure what those opportunities are, so the Spirit goes on now in the next three or four verses. Therefore, because the days are evil, or since the days are evil, don't be without reason. Don't be unwise. Now, if I were to to read that in the English and with what little Greek I know I would think that that word is Sophia with a negative but it isn't this is a word that speaks more of the reasoning power of the mind now until you have fully comprehended the fourth chapter of this epistle you really shouldn't be reading the fifth I guess because this cannot be the reasoning power of the old mind the old man this is that spiritual mind in which you are being renewed. Therefore, don't be without reason. That's the old mind. But, but be with reason, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, I might be pushing this too far, but I see in that verse that the Holy Spirit is exhorting us in this being renewed in the spirit of our minds, to use the reasoning power of that mind. I reached the conclusion long ago that many, many Christians are not reasoning out what they believe. I've used the illustration, for example, uh, before I listened to a man years ago teaching in Colossians, and I rejoiced. I reveled in the way that he expounded on the grace, on the sovereignty of God, and when he finished Colossians, he went to the book of Judges. And now I sat in the Bible class and I was totally depressed because he put me under law and human merit. And when I tried to point this out to him, he said, well, we're studying Judges now. And obviously God has a lesson for us here. And I said, well, above all things, the lesson for me is I don't want to be under judgment. I want to be under grace. And now that we're under grace, why shouldn't we do that? Why should we get a class of married people together and say, 
okay, now look, I want to put you back in, in the dating age. I mean, you can't do that. That's past. That's, that's past tense. That's history. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be back there. Maybe, maybe some of you do. I don't. Man, I'm, man, am I glad I'm not back there. I'm not under law. I'm not under law. There is no sense even trying to put my reasoning relationship under law because I'm redeemed by the grace of God in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm now in the sphere of grace and I stand in grace in the faithfulness of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and I can't push myself back to some other some other position. And it seems to me that when we're to reason out the will of the Lord, that we reason that out only in the revelation of that will, which is this book, His Word. It would seem to me then that in any of our teaching, we would be well advised to make sure that what we teach on any passage of Scripture is consistent. I can't put you under God's grace teaching uh, one chapter and, and under human merit in another. I also can't put you under law to get you under grace. When Jesus came and arrived on the scene and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, just as John the Baptist, he was, he was offering himself as king and and he was offering the kingdom and they refused. They rejected that offer. And much of the teaching that you see in the Gospels is law. We don't see that grace until after the cross. And many, many Christians get confused about that. They don't understand that there is a change of dispensations that took place. We have to be consistent. They listen to all of this teaching and they're not reasoning in themselves. And I'm going to suggest, first of all, the verse is not saying that you should follow my reasoning. Please don't follow my reasoning. Uh, I don't believe, in fact, I, I would suggest to you that the 17th birth, verse here that in this chapter, the 17th verse actually deals a death blow to, to popery. I don't believe the Holy Spirit is asking you to follow what I have reasoned out. But what you have reasoned out is God has revealed it in His Word. Therefore, the 17th verse to me is totally un, un understandable if I don't spend time in God's Word. I can't understand it unless I spend time in this book. And I don't mean a chapter a night before, you know, you hop into bed. I really wonder if one could look at the body of Christ, how much time that body really spends in the marvelous, infinitely wonderful revelation of Jesus Christ. Then we sit around and we wonder why that this garbage heap of carnality keeps popping up in our lives. And it's because we're not properly feeding the spiritual side. How can there be a reasoning process without energy expended in the Word of God? I don't think it comes easy. Maybe this is not the way you feel, but Christian after Christian leads me to believe that if God wants me to know, it ought to be easy to know. I don't find people complaining that this or that or or the other discipline is difficult to learn. People are, are willing every day to sacrifice in order to get a high school diploma, college diploma, master's degree, or a PhD. I mean, yeah, there's a little complaining, but not very much. We expect that to be hard. Somehow or, or another, Christians don't expect a reasoning out of the will of the Lord to take some energy some time and some study, but it does. Over and over again, we are exhorted to be diligent, to give diligence, to look earnestly, to behold, to see, to study, 
to study to show ourselves approved, to study these words that we see in this book, and it, and it does take time, and it does take effort. Ah, but I'm too busy with this or that or the other thing. Well, you might be, but I do not believe, I do not believe that it is possible to reason out the will of the Lord separate from this book. I'm 100% persuaded. I believe it is impossible to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior separate from this book. And now I have an exhortation of the Lord that I should reason out what the will of the Lord is. I don't think that's some dark secret that I need to follow on some YouTube channel or some treasure's map or some pirate's map, you know, to find the treasure. I believe his will is revealed in the word, but it takes time and it takes a comparison of scripture with scripture. I believe God has given us the opportunity because the days are evil. And he's given us many tools to do that. Many helps, and the more helps that you have, the easier this process may be. But the only thing you need is the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, look, we want to apply reasoning power, but the reasoning power I see applied is human. Now, if God be God, and we can go way, way back to some of the puzzles that have been presented to man, you know, if, if, if God is capable of handling evil, why is there evil? You know, if he's incapable of handling evil, then he's not much of a God. If he's capable and doesn't do it, then he doesn't have any love. You know, all that sounds, on the surface, reasonable. And, you know, and you reason through all that, and, and we're just following, you know, connecting the dots here and we we come out with either in the end we come out with either no god or a god who doesn't care but the reasoning is 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 totally and absolutely false because it's not infused with the truth of the word of god in order for god's grace to be revealed it is absolutely imperative that we have the fall and the total depravity of man. I believe that Adam's fall and man's total depravity is as indispensable to God's program as the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm absolutely persuaded that the death of Christ makes no sense without the fall of man and man's total inability to provide for himself. Therefore, it all must fit together in a precise revelation from Almighty God. It cannot be that our position on theological doctrine stands as though these are segmented channels which are totally independent of one another. Some will tell you it's not necessary that we understand something here to understand something there. And I'm suggesting to you that what I believe is it fits together as an integrated whole and that many a Christian, if pushed to the wall, would find that their entire theological uh, presuppositions would collapse when one looked at the parts that make up the whole of that theology. What does the death of Jesus Christ mean in my place without the fall of man and total depravity and, and so on? I need to reason out the will of the Lord. God said to live soberly, righteously with God and with his neighbor. That was God's answer. But Israel, they had to reason all that out. All of the, the precepts of the law, plus all the commentary on that law by the scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the lawyers that may have come up with a, a very lengthy answer you know, to that question. I'm going to suggest to you that buying up the opportunities because the days are evil is a twofold thing. First of all, it is not to be without reason, but to be with reason in the will of the Lord. You have an opportunity to study this book. I'm going to suggest to you that you and I every day are faced with opportunities. 
and maybe not in our lifetime, but I'm sure, I'm just as sure as I know my name, it will not be so easy for believers to gather together to worship. They may be tribulation saints, not church aid saints. Or, you know, because we don't have a crystal ball, we can't see the future. We don't know what God has in store for the church prior to the rapture. But it won't be so easy for believers to gather together to worship, to pray, and to study in the days to come. I don't know what's in God's program. I'm I don't have that crystal ball. I, I don't I don't I can't see into the future, but I am personally convinced that that this nation could fall just as others have. We're not some glorified, sanctified nation that's going to ride through and be the, the spiritual Israel as some people are foolishly teaching today. If our Lord tarries, it may not be long before some of you will be trotting through the woods and the briars will be cutting you to pieces and you'll wish you'd brought a Bible. I don't know. He, he didn't come last September and it appears 5778 is the year of our going home. And it could very well be that 5778 amounts to Nissan 1, not Tishri 1. I, but I do not believe the church will enter into the tribulation period. But that doesn't mean that we won't see persecution to some degree before the rapture occurs. I want to reason out what the will of the Lord is too, just like you. And I know that one aspect of the will of the Lord is to gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Might not be today, may not be tomorrow, may not be this year, may not be in your lifetime, but as sure as God is God, the day will come that that will occur. I think we're passing up opportunities every day to reason out the will of the Lord. Why is that verse right there right next since the days are evil don't be without reason but reason out what the will of the lord is you have his word you have the opportunity to study it you have the opportunity to fellowship together you're not going to hear me say I, I think you ought to study his word every minute of every day seven days a week around the clock non-stop you know without stopping to take you know a breath if if you gather too much manna, it gets stale. But you should gather it every day. If you don't gather enough, you get hungry. And that new man, which has been put on, doesn't grow. Now, I wouldn't dare suggest that God deserts you. Not at all. But I believe God has given us a wonderful opportunity to reason out His will. He didn't have to do that. If, as I believe, without question, this book teaches that I was totally depraved, totally unable to remedy my condition, and God in sovereign grace redeemed me by the death of Jesus Christ in my place. Well, if that's true, then by sovereign grace, he could have written in my mind, the entire Word of God in Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, and a thousand other languages and given me total recall. He could have done all that. I wished he had, in fact. I read in the Old Testament the day comes when he's going to write his law in the hearts of his people. Now, I recognize that I am hid in Christ with God. But it would be foolish for me to suggest that that verse doesn't mean that I should use any reasoning, that I don't need to reason out what the will of the Lord is. And it seems to me that what he has done is revealed it in his word. Look, folks, I am a great fan of personal study. And I believe it is wrong not to study. That's why I listened to tapes in an old pickup truck that my dad wouldn't, wouldn't have ever rode in so that I can hear what other idiots say. And then, of course, you get the opportunity to hear what this idiot says. 
and we wear the rough edges off of each other and we communicate through and that's through our communication with each other and we learn to love each other it, it seems very interesting to me that the very next verse is one of understanding the will of the Lord that until we've reasoned out the will of the Lord I don't think we have the right to say what we believe his will is I don't think I have the right to, to go to Oklahoma University and say I want to teach home economics well how much do you know about it well nothing but I've decided the Lord wants me to teach it I mean the university would be stupid to hire me to teach home economics I mean I burn water when I try to heat it they'd have to look into my background and see in fact whether or not I'm qualified to do that and I believe the Holy Spirit does that before I can proclaim the good news of God's truth I need to know what it is so the first exhortation seems to be to reason out what the will of the Lord is and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled with the Spirit and now it appears we're now being placed back under law so why are we being told not to be like Otis Campbell on Andy Griffith I think that we can see our way through this folks I really do we have died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God we know that and going back to what I mentioned previously about being consistent that's key so it appears we're now being placed back under law the law that we've died to so we're gonna look at it slowly obviously it seems to me one could read in verse 18 if we ignored the context that you just shouldn't get drunk let's just throw context completely out the window folks let's just say there is no such thing there's no such thing as context and we just shouldn't get drunk this is just mixed in with a long list of other do's and don'ts I mean seriously folks do you honestly think that's the way that we should approach this book now I happen to believe that I have I have nothing absolutely nothing against that particular application of the verse if, if that's the way you want to look at it fine doesn't contradict anything else in Scripture as long as it doesn't contradict anything I could say that this reminds me of the prodigal son riotous living the habit which sends everything to wreck and ruin and, and this in contrast to being filled with the spirit so you know instead of singing and dancing with a bottle of Jack Daniels you know seek the joy that the spirit inspires since God has made us to sit with Christ in heavenly places the pouring out of your joyous feelings and drunken melodies in contrast to singing Christian hymns where that one expresses his joy not in drunken or worldly songs but in Christian hymns of thankfulness I mean because honestly how can we do both drinking you know getting drunk it hurts the mind hurts the memory hurts your judgment it deprives you of reason it brings diseases on your body it affects responsible stewardship over your finances it opens up every door for sin exposing you to shame and danger I could preach on that all day long John the Baptist abstained from drinking to keep himself separate from the world and I could preach on that forever I, I mean I I don't have a problem preaching on that just kinda you know I could just ramble on for hours but I don't happen to think that that's the primary application but if you said to me if you said to me God you know does God say that we should not be controlled by alcohol I'd say absolutely he says that now it's between you and the Lord as to whether or not you use alcohol at all but if you but if you use it in excess I believe you're sinning you're, you're I believe you're sinning against the truth of this book but that's not the main point of the verse 
It's an application of the verse. Folks, we've done this before with other passages. If you follow these these videos on this series in Ephesians, lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man. Colossians chapter 3. Now, I, I absolutely believe that an application of that verse is that you shouldn't tell lies to each other. Don't lie to your wife. Don't lie to your husband. Don't lie to your children. And so on and so on. And I tried to point out that that as we covered that passage of Scripture, that is an, an application of the passage. I don't happen to think it's the primary application of that passage, but it is a truthful one. I don't believe God wants us to lie one to another. And I think the passage says, don't let alcohol control you. The verse is interesting because there are a number of Christians who absolutely insist that Christ could not have tasted fermented grape juice. Now, if he didn't, there are two possibilities that, that face you. He drank it within a day or two of the time that it was squeezed, or he worked a miracle on it, you know, because they didn't have refrigerators. Now, without question, the wine that they used was in fact that and was important because of the pollution of their water supply. I believe the verse says you shouldn't get drunk. That That is a command. It's in the, it's in the imperative mood. You shouldn't get drunk. Don't be drunk. Don't get drunk. And I believe that that's a Christian command. But I'm going to repeat, however, that I don't believe it is the primary application of this verse. Please don't anybody write to me and say, Steve, you know, you know, you, 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 what, you, you think you think we can just, it's just fine that we just all get drunk. You know? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, that at all. That is a command. Don't be drunk. Don't get drunk. But I don't believe it's the primary application of this verse. Redeeming the time. Let's go back to verse 14. We were told that God's people, we, you, me, I was asleep and Christ said, awake, arise from the dead. Now he calls me both asleep and he calls me dead, but I'm not a child of the devil. You know, the, the popular concept of redemption uh, in evangelism nowadays is that you were a child of the devil headed for hell and you accepted Christ because you saw you needed a Savior, and now there's a dramatic change takes place, and you become a child of God headed for heaven. In other words, tear becomes wheat, goats become sheep, you, you become something different than what you were sown. I believe the scriptural revelation is that I'm God's child, but I was asleep, and I was dead as far as God was concerned, and had I physically died in that particular condition, I still would have gone to heaven because I was God's child. What we're looking at now is my personal relationship and understanding with God. Wake up, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And I believe he shines on you in the word of God. Because this is true, then see that you walk very carefully, circumspect, uh, circumspectly, accurately, not as those who have no wisdom, but those who do have wisdom. First of all, you put on the new man, and secondly, you have the word of God redeeming the time because the days are evil. Well, it looks to me, folks, like this whole context now suddenly said, here are some opportunities and and what's he talking about? Opportunities for what? Being wise, not unwise. Being with reason, not without reason. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. And we'll, and we'll get to proclaiming this good news to others. But at the moment, it seems as though the whole setting is the fact that Christ has shined on me. And that now, now, after everything that's been said. Key point here. After everything that's been said. 
I need to buy up the opportunities that I might grow in that truth and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Now, many of you are familiar with the word sozo for salvation. The word in the Greek, salvation, is sozo. Don't be filled or drunk with wine in which there is no, there is no sozo. The word there you'll see in the original text is asetia, asozo. It's the negative. No deliverance, no salvation. That's what caught my attention. You don't believe me? Go and look at it. The word is there. It's, it's your word for saved with the negative in front of it. Don't be filled or drunk with wine wherein there is no deliverance. There's no deliverance. This is what the text says. There is no salvation. Does that mean that, that, that one who is drunk with wine goes to hell? Of course not. That's because... Mentally, we've been conditioned to use words differently than what God, than how God uses them. So I, th I think we got to be very careful here. I've, I've mentioned this before, and it's, it's, it's simply a hobby of mine, I guess. I don't believe the Word of God is filled with synonyms. And yet, Christian after Christian would ask me to believe that redemption, justification, sanctification, righteousness, glorification, you know, Salvation, they're all the same thing. You can use those words freely. You can use them interchangeably because they all basically mean exactly the same thing. And I don't believe they do. In fact, I know they don't. And I absolutely believe that they don't mean they're not synonymous to the Holy Spirit. And that he does not so freely use them that way. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but be saved. No, no, the word's not sozo, not at all. Should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if we translated it saved, well, everybody would be happy. Most of my Christian friends probably think that's what it says, and I don't think that the Holy Spirit is quite that loose with the language. This is such an excess of wine that there is no deliverance. There's no deliverance. Here's, what the, here's what's really interesting. I found out that this is really, I, count, I counted at least 13 times that the word sober appears in the New Testament in a context that pertains to, guess what? Spiritual growth, grace, not law. That's right. Any number of people who are not familiar with the control of alcohol would suggest, well, you know, I may be drunk, but I'm still in control. I'm, you know, how many times have you heard that? So much alcohol in the blood does adversely affect response time and reasoning power. We know that, especially when driving. Then you realize that, you know, well, if every driver were absolutely sober and completely in control of his faculties. There isn't one driver in a thousand knows how to handle that car, even then, let, a, let alone when they've got a little booze in their system. The majority of drivers on the highway have never been in a skid, have never known what it is to recover from a skid, never understood the logic of braking or steering ability or geometry or the weight of the vehicle, the design of the automobile or the, the weight distribution or any of, that, any of that stuff. Pickups with hay bales traveling down the road near me here loaded so high that the front wheels hardly touch the road. You'd have to hiccup to get it to steer. I know some hay haulers in my area, in my local vicinity here, that are just as much a threat on the highway as the man who's drunk. So, you know, I'm always on the lookout for the combination of both, you know, the hay and the alcohol mix. So it's a bad deal even if you're in control of your faculties. So I don't, I don't want very much alcohol in you, frankly, you know, while you're driving down the road because I'm scared of you anyway. We have lots of evidence 
that this adversely affects response time. The point I'm trying to make here is that a man may consider himself to be absolutely in control of his faculties, and he's not. Uh, there is no deliverance. That's the funny thing about alcohol. There are, there are some people who have done this enough who know that their reaction times are changed and that their reasoning power has been affected, but any number do not and the Holy Spirit's not talking about the town drunk here. I don't, I don't really think that he's talking about Otis Campbell on Andy Griffith here in this passage, who knows when he's drunk and that he isn't making any sense when he is, but about one who is drunk with wine where there is no deliverance. He still thinks he has reasoning power and he doesn't. He can't control the alcohol unless there, there is some medical thing I don't know about. Nobody can take alcohol and control it. It will control you like the old man. Once you have consumed it, it will control you. Once you embrace law as a rule of life, it will control you. It's going to be in control. You are not and there is no deliverance. Sozo. Ongoing deliverance from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, the flesh. None of that. Now I think no alcohol is simply used here as an illustration of what the Holy Spirit is trying to say. I'm going to suggest to be not drunk with wine wherein is excess is simply a physical illustration that we can all understand of the terrible devastation of the old man. If you are under the reasoning power of the old man rather than the new man, there is no deliverance. There's no deliverance, folks. And no matter how you try to clean up that old man, it will not work. Like being drunk. No matter how straight you try and walk the line, you're going to stagger. The old man will control you. And Christian after Christian is trying to control the old man. Just as many and many a person who drinks is trying to control the alcohol, it will not work. Alcohol controls. The old man controls. And I'm not trying to destroy this passage for anybody who thinks this is a passage against getting drunk. I think that's true. But I believe that there is a much deeper truth here that the reasoning power of the old man is just like alcohol. There's no deliverance from that. It will control, you will not. And any Christian that sets out to decide that he's going to control his own nature is in for total and absolute failure. It won't work, it will not work, any better than you going out and deciding that you'll control the alcohol. On the other hand, be filled with the Spirit, and that's where I believe I'll pick up in the next video, where I hope many listening to these videos will, will learn to find their sobriety in the new man. I love you all, I truly do. If you're finding these videos to be encouraging, helpful in any way, I'd truly love to hear from you. You can email me from our website at blessedhope2018.com. Thank you for all your prayers, messages of encouragement and support. I really do love you and appreciate you for all of that. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for listening.